say to our public witness, we will begin momentarily. We want to give um, people a chance to um, log on and join us. Hello, my name is Maria Elena Perales. I am the, uh, I'm a part of the St. Joseph Justice Center team. And on behalf of St. Joseph, the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange, I welcome you to today's public witness. The title for today's prayer is, How Does Our Faith Guide Us in Addressing Unjust Healthcare Disparities Experienced by Racial Minorities, Especially the Poor and Vulnerable? Our presenters today our sister Erlinda Machado, Erlinda Ramirez Machado. She's a sister of St. Joseph. She has recently been named Associate Novice Director and participates in the following boards. Latino Health Access, Concern America, and St. Jude's Neighborhood Health Center. Sister Martha Ann is a sister of St. Joseph and is very much involved in the Justice Committee and also in other advocacy groups. Sister Tui Tran, a sister of St. Joseph, works at Mission Hospital in the Ministry of Mission Integration. And Dr. Sergio Ulises Rodas is Chief Financial Medical, Chief Medical Officer Camino Health Center in San Juan Capistrano. And behind the scenes, we have Yesenia, who's also a member of St. Joseph Justice Center. I want to give you an overview for today's program. So we will begin with prayer, testimony by Dr. Rodas, and then the litany that will be um, read by Sister Linda, and then reflection and action. Um, led by Sister Tui. Thank you for joining us today. And we will now begin with opening prayer by Sister Martha Ann. We start with an examen, which is kind of like a mirror of oneself. Have I done enough to inform myself about the sin of racism, its roots and its his, his, history and contemporary manifestation as it is evidenced in healthcare disparities? Have I opened my heart to see how unequal access to health care on the basis of, of skin color, race, or ethnicity has denied and continues to deny the equal dignity of others. Is there a root of racism within me that blurs my vision of who my neighbor is when I read of the disparities of COVID-19 among Blacks, Latinos, and other minority groups. Have I ever witnessed an occasion where someone was a victim to personal, institutional, systemic, or social racism? and I did or said nothing, leaving the person to address their pain alone.
O most divine healer, you heal those who approached through a gentle word or an action or word. None who came to you were denied. Let your justice roll down this country. Let it convert those who place wealth above health. Bless those who are ill needing treatment, but who have, lack the money to pay for it. Let our style of government change and serve its people, not corporate interest. Bless those who are today's healers, doctors, nurses, and all medical staff. Let them be filled with your mercy and compassion as they touch the suffering, the dying. Bless them in their mission and service to all. And we ask this in your loving name, amen. Oh, good morning. Can uh, everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Dr. Sergio Rodas. I have been a family physician for 33 years and have spent my entire career in community medicine. And I'd like to present my personal testimony with regards to my experience of the underserved and, yes, at times, racism within the medical system. I'd like to preface it by saying that there's an old proverb that exists in many, many cultures about a group of blind men that are each feeling an elephant. And each man tells them what they feel. And depending on what they're feeling of that animal, they give a very different picture. One says it's a sail, one says it's a tree trunk, one says it's a snake. They're all right, but they describe something very differently. So with that, I'd like to emphasize that what I'm talking about today is really my feeling of what part of the elephant I've been exposed to. There are other viewpoints from other physicians and it has to do with their individual experience. But this just happens to be mine. Most of us, when we think of healthcare, we think about getting our flu shot, going in for our annual visit, having a physical. But there are many other things that have to do with healthcare that have very little to do with what happens inside the doctor's office. I came to the United States in the middle of the middle in the civil rights battle in the 1960s. I remember going to the South on a Greyhound bus and seeing black and white bathrooms in the bus stations and being perplexed that I didn't know which one I was supposed to use. But I also saw that the United States was involved in the civil rights battle. I was a child, that's really all I could perceive. But even then, healthcare was viewed as a civil right. And one of the quotes that I really like is one by Dr. King, where he actually commented on healthcare. And he said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and humane. And it was during this time that the Community Health Center movement was started. Uh, in 1965, there were two community health centers started on a grant. Today, there are more than 2,900 community health centers servicing 27 million people. That's my work, that's what I do. And in my work, I am on a daily basis exposed to the disparities that prevent people from having adequate health care. Nothing to do with what prescription I write really the world they come in. By and large, it's dictated by poverty. The vast majority of my patients live at a level of what can be considered poverty. And this, of course, manifests in the rest of their lives. For example, housing. This has been particularly underlined because of the COVID crisis. We see that communities of lower socioeconomic class have a much higher incidence of COVID. And why is that? 
Is it that they're unaware, unmotivated? Well, simply stated, it has to do with living conditions. Here in San Juan, it's not unusual for me to see four or five families living in one large house where each family has a bedroom. They're sharing the kitchen, they're sharing the bathroom. And with this large group that spans many generations, it really takes one person to have been exposed to COVID, bringing it into this house. And I found it really difficult to tell a patient, you need to isolate yourself, stay in one bedroom, one bathroom for you only, and, and they laugh. It's simply not feasible. What that of course leads to is multiple members of families becoming sick. Here at the health center, we've actually seen cases where first the mother went into the hospital for two weeks, then the father went into the hospital for the two weeks, and all the teenage kids are sick. Simply stated, social distancing was not possible for them. The sanitation available to them is simply not conductive to what we call social distancing, and certainly not the quarantining. I also see the effects on the lower socioeconomic class of, of what the effect of hunger and malnutrition has. In the 1960s, people were getting sick because they didn't have enough to eat. Frankly, they didn't have enough to eat. And some doctors in those days would actually write prescriptions for food. And they would allege that the treatment for malnutrition was food. In the 2000s, we are having patients get sick and die for malnutrition, not from the lack of food, but from having the wrong types of food in the stores that are available to them in their local neighborhoods. And economics. A two liter bottle of Coke costs $1.50 and a gallon of milk costs $3.50. So you see mothers buying Coke for their children. I go into exam rooms and I see children e eating Cheetos, like it's a fundamental nutrient because that's what's, that's what's available to them. You try to talk to them about purchasing I tell a family, you need to buy organic chicken, they laugh. They can't afford that. They have to eat what's possible and what's available. And as a result, we see the long time effects. And I see the grandmothers, the grandfathers, who are 20, 30 years down the line. And they're now victims of amputations, blindness, and early death. All having to do with lower socioeconomic strata and by and large, correlating with their racial class. It's largely people of color, that primarily I treat with Hispanics, that must be satisfied with the lower end jobs. For example, in employment, my patients can't take sick time off, they don't have it. My patients can't work from home. You can't clean uh, tables in a restaurant from home. Often they'll work as caregivers in, uh, care facilities. They can't stay home from that. They don't have the ability to sit home at a laptop and work. And in fact, even when they are sick, they'll even keep their diagnosis secret. I've had many patients who were diagnosed as COVID positive and the desire to go to work makes it such that they continue to go to work and keep their diagnosis secret, up to and including not wearing a mask. Is it because they're crass and callous and inconsiderate? No, it's because their children are hungry and there simply is no alternative. But perhaps the saddest specter I've seen before COVID is in the last few years of our current governor, uh, US government. Yes, racism existed. People experienced it. You spoke of it as an exception. But now I have patients tell me who as a matter of course, they have severe, harsh racial insults hurled at them in public. I had one woman who was standing in line at McDonald's speaking in Spanish to her children and she was uh, verbally assaulted by a man for speaking Spanish, screaming at her, made her cry, made the children cry. The good point is that the other clients within that McDonald's rapidly came to her defense. So there's a saving grace to it. I had another man who is an elderly Hispanic gentleman who still wears a broad brimmed hat 
and walks around with Mexican waraches. He looks like he just arrived. Very nice man. U.S. citizen, as a matter of fact, who walked into a Starbucks and the manager, who sadly was a young Hispanic man, asked him to leave. Again, the saving grace was the clientele of that Starbucks gathered around him and stopped the manager from throwing him out. In fact, what they said is that if they threw him out, they would also leave. So that, but what shocks me is that where racist language was once something reserved for a very small percentage of the time, and that I heard about it maybe once, twice a year, if that, now I hear about it as a matter of course. And it didn't really hit me until I personally got to feel what my patients felt like. I was at an auto dealership dropping my car off for service. The service advisor knows me well. I've known him for years. And we always speak in Spanish. So I was talking to him in Spanish. And a man, an elderly gentleman, came up to us and demanded that we speak in English. But this was the United States, and we needed to speak in English. You know what I noticed about him? He had a heavy French accent. So I did what my patients are incapable of doing. And I turned to him and I answered him in French. And I informed him that my service manager and I spoke in Spanish. It's a language we shared, just as you and I could talk in French if we wanted to. But let's talk English. Well, that felt good at my level, but I'm a very different person. I can do that. My patients are afraid. They're afraid of angering the individual. They're afraid of having an immigration call. And they simply live and learn to accept it. It is my sincere hope that we will soon see racism, overt racism, be placed back on the trash heap of history where it's lived for many years and where only recently have the embers been stirred. I am uh, very attached to my patients, and I think what I would say to all of you is that you don't have to provide penicillin to a patient to improve their health care. Simply doing a small part to improve either their ability to have food, decent housing, water, and even just plain old dignity. My patients often talk to me. This is a phrase that I was using earlier, and I really, I'm very touched by it. They like it when someone looks at them and not through them. So you see them in public, it's easy to ignore them. But if you acknowledge them and speak to them, they gain a lot from that. I know when I switch to Spanish in a retail setting, the person lights up, they have a friend. If we can do that, that small measure in and of itself, to grant someone just the basic dignity of they're another person and you are acknowledging them actually helps to build their self-esteem. In the end, difficult times, COVID has unmasked them. But I'm an optimist. I've done this for nearly 35 years and I'm confident that we will come out of this and that we will eventually be able to rele relegate racism back to where it belongs. Rarely heard about, quiet, and a source of shame not of voices.
as God's children, we are aware of God's unending compassion, care, and concern. And so we confidently pray. that we may be the agents of God's healing power to those most in need. For the unsure, that they need be encouraged by your presence and given new hope by the love and care of their brothers and sisters. Compassionate and merciful God, hear our prayer. For all who are blessed with health and security, may they work to fulfill the needs of those who are sick and unsure. Compassionate and merciful God, hear our prayer. For leaders who make decisions that affect the health and well being of others, may they strive to ensure the fundamental right to health care. Compassionate and merciful God, hear our prayer. For all engaged in health care, that they may be strengthened to show mercy, compassion, and love to those they serve. Compassionate and merciful God, hear our prayer. For all who have contracted the coronavirus. Compassionate and merciful God, hear our prayer. For all who suffer from health disparities, than result in worse outcomes. Compassionate and merciful God, hear our prayer. To advocate for persons of the margins of society and to promote and defend human dignity. Compassionate and merciful God, hear our prayer. We now have an opportunity to reflect on what we have heard. Let's pause, take a deep breath, and reflect on the following. Next time I come across a vulnerable person, Will I be able to acknowledge them in a dignified way and not see directly through them? Can I make it a point to treat my fellow neighbor as my equal and stay away from othering him or her?
So now we invite you to look at some of the actions that we have come up with. We need to advocate against cuts to social security and Medicare. Uh, urge legislators to focus on much needed reforms to help people with Medicare maintain health, support Medicaid and health programs to help vulnerable communities stay healthy during COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm going to share with you um, what I have been called to address the needs of our community. Uh, actually, the past uh, two years, I have been out in the community uh, in Orange County and really work with our uh, underserved communities, communities of color, and um, seeing the, our immigrant community not having, knowing where to go, a medical home, uh, our homeless community, and uh, who's advocating for our community of color. And so um, uh, being frustrated, not being able to really convince so many people, uh, I uh, collaborated with a few members from the Advanced OC, and that's how Advanced OC. So recently, the Board of Supervisor approved um, us to look at COVID and moving forward the effects of COVID on the rich and the poor and communities of color and especially our vulnerable communities. And so events OC was set up to shine the spotlight of our needy communities. Uh, we create an equity map to show how neighborhoods are doing. Uh, we collect data from public and private sources to geographically display how communities are doing uh, using the five social factors. Um, within the social progress, we are able to identify the basic needs such as clean water in the neighborhood, public safety, uh, foundation of wellness. Um, uh, with the Asian community, cancer is a, a high it, it, uh, risk issues, uh, Hispanic community as well. It, um, and so we are able to identify like the different ethnicity, the groups, uh, what is going on in their health situation. And uh, we're looking at how are we inclusive and uh, encourage a civic engagement as well. Uh, the map will help us identify if we are succeeding or, or we are falling short uh, with our communities. And we can see the difference by the disparate, this, the display of inequity down to the census track level. So when we're looking at census work at this moment, uh, we're over, going to overlay that for our uh, 2020 census and seeing the inequity in our community and how are we going to address that. At Advanced OC, we challenge ourselves with one fundamental question. What is the greatest need in Orange County? Are the communities the same or different? If they are different, we are able to pinpoint the most vulnerable in our community with customized solutions. Uh, with our actionable data, we help public and private funders to be more efficient with limited resources. By mapping equity, community members can also make a difference collective impact to help us achieve higher social progress for all. So as we look at inequity, how are we being the voice of those that need our voice? And so I really thank our health system, Providence St. Joseph's Health, our sister of St. Joseph, um, for really being forward thinker to uh, support this work around inequity. Thank you, everyone, for today's prayer, for your leadership, Dr. Rodas, for caring for the most vulnerable and for addressing the inequity, Sister Tweet. Thank you all for being and participating in today's prayer. Um, we invite you to reflect and to pray about what you've heard this morning. And uh, like, like, the, like Dr. Rodas mentioned, let's make an effort to acknowledge people when we meet them, to look at them and not see through them. I, I definitely can relate to that. 
And I hope we make the best, we make that as one of our actions to think about as we move on. And until um, next week, have a good day. Thank you all.